String theory has attracted a lot of criticism. It's often used as an example for everything that goes wrong in the foundations of physics, so much so that a lot of people think I'm criticizing string theory even when I'm not. Sometimes I'm breathing in a German accent. Okay, but this video isn't about me. It's about not the loudest, but the most respected string theory critic, Roger Penrose. His criticism now got a very detailed reply from string theorists. I had a look at the paper. Roger Penrose won a Nobel Prize in 2020 for his work on black holes, notably the singularity theorems. I've met quite a few Nobel Prize winners over the years, but Penrose stands out among them. For one thing, his background is in mathematics rather than physics, and usually mathematicians don't get anywhere in physics. They just end up proving theorem after theorem with little relevance for reality, think Ed Witten. The other thing that's special about Penrose is that he writes popular science books that are quite technical indeed and yet find a large audience. I'd go so far to say that Penrose has established somewhat of a new style of scholarly communication in physics. But now about string theory. In 2016, Penrose published a book called Fashion, Faith and Fantasy. The fashion part is about string theory. In his book, he argues string theory has some serious problems that string theorists seem to entirely ignore. One example he has is the question of what all these extra dimensions are doing in a universe that's filled with energy. If you remember, in string theory one needs additional dimensions of space other than the three that we're used to. These additional dimensions can't be infinite in extension, they must be very small, otherwise we'd already have noticed them. The strings can wrap around the dimensions and oscillate in them. The wavelengths of these oscillations have to fit to the size of the extra dimensions. This is where the analogy to violin strings comes from. These oscillations are like the harmonics of a violin string. Now, usually string theorists say that we don't see any of the higher harmonics because the energy to make the strings oscillate is extremely high, somewhere at the Planck energy. So you need a particle collider the size of the galaxy to make make the oscillations in the extra dimensions wiggle and observe them. Penrose, however, says that this doesn't make sense because, you see, these extra dimensions aren't in one place. They're everywhere. This is like, you know, the direction up isn't just here above me, it's everywhere. And then Penrose says, if you take the entire energy that's in our space, then that's easily enough to make the strings in the extra dimensions vibrate. The problem is that this would be observable and we don't observe it. Penrose writes, although the Planck energy is indeed very large when compared with normal particle physics energies, it's still not that big an energy being comparable with the energy released in the explosion of about one ton of TNT. There is, of course, enormously more energy than this available in the known universe. For example, the energy received from the Sun by the Earth in one second is some 10 to the 8 times larger. On energy terms alone, that would be far more than sufficient to excite the extra dimensions for the entire universe. The authors of the new paper now review this and several others of Penrose's arguments. On the matter of the vibrating extra dimensions, they say that to get any observable effect, one really needs all this energy to be localized in one region and not be spread out through the universe. It's because they show the relevant quantities, not the total energy, but the energy in a volume of space-time. If one wants to create an oscillation in these extra dimensions, everywhere in the universe, one would still have to first create it locally and then get it to spread. Easiest way to recognize a true science paper? Footnotes large enough to camp in. They address several other points of Penrose's critique, but there's one that they agree on. It's that the equations that one needs to describe our space-time in string theory are not just Einstein's equations. They have infinitely many corrections. Penrose worries that this requires specifying infinitely detailed initial data, which ironically is very similar to the problem with infinitely many correction terms that string theory was meant to solve. The new paper agrees that this is a genuine open question and deserves proper analysis. 
more work is needed. The reason I'm telling you about this is not so much to do with string theory, is that it's a lovely example of scientific discourse done right. Someone raises a criticism, someone else addresses it. This is how science progresses with fashion, faith and footnotes. How does that work? Why is that so? If those are questions you also like to ask, you should really have a look at Brilliant. It's a great way to practice your problem-solving skills and your critical thinking. All courses on Brilliant have interactive visualizations and come with follow-up questions. What you see here is from their newly updated maths courses. No matter how abstract the topic seems, Brilliant's courses have intuitive visualizations that really click into my brain. I found it to be a highly effective way to build up knowledge. And Brilliant covers a large variety of topics in science, computer science and maths, from general scientific thinking to dedicated courses just what I'm interested in. Sounds good? I hope it does. You can try Brilliant yourself for free and if you use my link brilliant.org slash Sabine or scan the QR code you'll get 20% off the annual premium subscription. So go and give it a try. I'm sure you won't regret it. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.